This is Philanthropy Unfiltered, a podcast series featuring interviews with philanthropists and leaders in the social sector. I'm Kat Rosketta, founding executive director of the Center for High Impact Philanthropy. In this episode, our host, Jake Leaf, speaks to Dina Powell, former White House staffer under George W. Bush and one of the first Arab American women to work in the U.S. government. Dina is now working in the private sector as president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation and head of Goldman Sachs Impact Investing Initiatives. Today, Dina explains how institutions can use tools such as impact investing and donor advised funds to make a difference with their dollars, using Goldman Sachs' philanthropic initiatives as an example. Let's join them. I'm sitting here with Dina Powell, president of Goldman Sachs Foundation, head of impact investing business. Uh, after a high-profile career in politics, Dina decided to join Goldman, where she's become a partner as well as establish herself as a leader in the social space. So, Dina, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, when you moved to Goldman Sachs, what was your initial vision for transforming philanthropy here at the firm? Well, thank you um, for such a nice way to introduce it. I, I would actually say it was more building on a very important ethos of Goldman Sachs that investing in the communities in which we live and work was something that was always a priority. And we've seen that over you know, many generations now, whether it was our uh, earliest leaders, Gus Levy, who really invested in the development of Mount Sinai, Hank Paulson in terms of the work that he has done uh, on the environment, um, and then of course our current CEO who really pushed us to think about the next iteration of impact investment at Goldman Sachs. What has happened that I think is a trend actually in this space is that companies and institutions and individuals are really asking the question, how do I make meaningful, measurable impact and leverage my investment most effectively? So it is not seen as different than the ROE or the ROI that you would think about in terms of um, you know, investment dollars. Over the last eight years, we've really tried to build what we call our impact investing platform. It has three pillars to it. The first is what we call the institutional, uh, which is the Goldman Sachs Foundation. What do we as an institution focus on? You know, if you don't have a focus, you're all things to all people. We obviously believed that the most differentiating focus uh, where we could really add unique value was the empowerment of entrepreneurs around the world. And so we launched 10,000 Women and 10,000 Small Businesses US UK to really provide businesses and business owners with the tools they need to grow, to reach their potential as drivers of economic growth and job creation. So how, how did you look at success with those two programs? How do you define success? Well, first, we very purposely um, were a numerical group at Goldman Sachs, and so the name itself made a statement that we are going to hold ourselves accountable. In the case of uh, each of those programs, 10,000 entrepreneurs, 10,000 women entrepreneurs around the world, and 10,000 women, and we really uh, set out from the launch of the program with a set of metrics that we would measure. Revenue growth for the businesses, job creation, and really in both programs, but particularly in 10,000 Women, we knew that this was such a opportunity for a leveraged investment because women take 90% of their income and reinvest it into the community, into education for their children, health care, wellness for the community. So we really were able to say when our CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, stood up and announced 10,000 Women, we really looked at it as an investment. Uh, opportunity, that the best investment we could find at Goldman Sachs was the investing in female entrepreneurs globally. Tell me about a Goldman Sachs Gives a Bit, your donor advice fund for partners in the firm to distribute money to organizations. Sure. Um, that was also developed um, in 2007-2008. It's a partner-directed donor advised fund. Uh, partners of the firm actually have an account that they are able to direct those dollars to the 501c3s or nonprofits of their choice and we've had 100% participation. It's brought partners together to do uh, major coordinated gifts. For example, uh, we had 80 partners come together to fund a $20 million veterans program, which actually has helped wounded veterans returning to have service opportunities, employment opportunities through a network of nonprofits that we've worked with. Uh, so I think when partners come together to actually say, you know, this is my cause, it's really, I'm really passionate about it, I'd love you to support it, you know, it builds community, it obviously deploys an enormous amount of capital. So we've actually deployed $1 billion to thousands of nonprofit organizations around the world, including Wharton. So everybody wants to give to their alma mater, including the University of Pennsylvania, um, and we've been very proud to work with the leadership there 
and encourage our partners to use their GS Gives dollars to fund scholarships for uh, those who can't afford it or need financial aid. And so that's been a very differentiating part, I think, of GS Gives. So I've heard you speak before conferences and I've heard you talk about solving global challenges, about making sure all the legs of the stool are represented, public, private, uh, nonprofit sector. How can these work more effectively together? Well, I think that we're in an era and entering um, an even more robust part of this era that the three legs of the stool have to work together, the public, the private, and the nonprofit. We certainly have that as a goal for all of our work. You know, we're one institution, so ultimately we can be proud to develop models that address market gaps, uh, like 10,000 women, 10,000 small businesses, even the philanthropic entity that is Goldman Sachs gives. But if you really want to scale these programs, you have to have co-investors and you have to bring public and private together. Probably our best example of that is when we neared reaching the 10,000th woman in the program, uh, we actually you know, got a call from Jim Kim, the president of the World Bank, and Jin Young Kai, the head of the IFC, who called and said, we've seen your data and we would like to help you scale it. So I'm very proud to say that along with the World Bank, uh, we've created the world's first female-focused financing vehicle that will raise up to $600 million with co-investments from Goldman Sachs, the World Bank, other investors, and that will actually benefit 100,000 women in uh, loan sizes of $30,000 uh, on average. So that's an actual new product. Right now there's microfinance at kind of the lower end of the lending spectrum, and then there's a tiny group of fortunate females who around the world can get venture capital. But the missing middle was really that capital. And so we were very proud to, again, incubate a lot of this at Goldman Sachs, and then work with a multilateral institution to scale it. So what really hasn't worked in the last eight years or so since you've been here? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, I think that we got a little bit uh, late to let's bring co-investors in. I mean, we have a complete network of global partners. So we are so proud that we now work with over 100 academic and nonprofit partners just on our foundation work. And then we work literally with 8,000 nonprofits that have received grants from GS Gives. Um, I think that we always felt that, you know, you build a program, you fund it yourself, you execute it, you hold yourselves accountable. Um, and I think that, you know, now that we see there's so much interest in collaboration from government, multilateral institutions, our clients are interested in co-investing alongside of us in what we call our social impact space. So, you know, I wish we'd started earlier, but I think you have to prove the concept first before you bring other investors in, and that's what we've worked hard to do. So what are some of the most important lessons you've learned since you've entered the social space? you must know what you're trying to achieve. You actually have to have a theory of change or a focus that you believe this investment uh, will address that social challenge, the global development challenge. You have to measure. Um, philanthropy tends to not have a marketplace. Um, there's market forces for a lot of investments and this is a space where you have to create your own when you're making these kinds of philanthropic investments. So. In our case, we really set clear metrics for each of our programs. Um, and then partnership. That's the, the third, and I would say maybe even in some ways the most important. That when you're investing in cities as diverse around the world as Monrovia, Liberia, Kabul, Afghanistan, um, New Orleans, Louisiana, you really need to make sure that you're working with respected local partners if you really want it to be sustainable and if you really want to have the credibility locally that you really care deeply and you want to work with people to enhance their capacity to serve the community. So I think these are really complex social problems we're all dealing with out there and how can we create a market where we encourage from the philanthropic side a lot more risk? Well, we are certainly, hopefully, one of the institutions at the forefront of thinking about that. Obviously, you've got to take more risk. I mean, when we first announced um, that we were going to try to educate 10,000 women around the world with business and management education, links to capital, technical advice, you know, people said, how in the world are you going to run that? Who are you going to have implemented? So um, that, I hope, is one of the reasons why being at Goldman Sachs is particularly helpful when you're doing this kind of work because you got to have a really robust business plan. You got to present it to the management committee, the board of directors. You know, we have had we have lots of checks and balances, but that makes it, I think, rigorous in the way that we think about every investment at Goldman Sachs. So I, I think that risk is good with a very strong execution plan and a very strong uh, set of mitigants that if something goes wrong, you're able to respond. So who's the best in the game out there? Who's having the most impact? What, what has impressed you out there? 
You know, I would say what I've seen firsthand are the people that we work with. So mayors, you know, who are just saying, you know, we're going to try to find solutions to our problems. Uh, Mayor Mitch Landrieu, we've been working in New Orleans over the last several years. He not only said, I want to bring New Orleans back after the tragedy of Katrina. I want to make it a model city in the country. And so, you know, it is now literally a lab of innovation. Entrepreneurs are going there to start their businesses. And you've got to have, you know, I think that kind of uh, local leadership. I would say, obviously, we have a great advisory council that helps us with these initiatives. It's co-chaired by Lloyd, our CEO, Warren Buffett, Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, and uh, Michael Bloomberg. The fact that they invest so much time uh, really makes a difference. And I, you know, I mentioned Michael Bloomberg. I would say I think he's one of the greatest philanthropists in the country. Uh, he has taken a lot of these tenants that we have tried to implement as well, which are partnership, competition for strong ideas, global networks, measurement, and transparent results sharing. He recently came out with his annual letter on philanthropy, which really talked about you know, the fact that, again, the best thing an institution or individual can do is create a new idea, a new model, and then work with others to scale it. So one last question. What's your advice for an individual who made some money, decided to start a family foundation? How should they start thinking about approaching their own philanthropy? I would say first, get the expertise you need. I think people feel that you shouldn't spend any administrative dollars. You shouldn't hire the right individuals or, you know, if it's consultants as you're building it. It's a real expertise. You know, if you want to run it like a business and have the efficacy that, of course, all philanthropists want to have, you have to have the right people help you set that up. Secondly, I think just knowing what you want to accomplish, you know, actually having a clear set of objectives that you really care about and going pretty granular on when your particular area of expertise and investment, um, how it can make a difference, and then making sure that you don't spend a dime until you have a metric system set up. And then, of course, most importantly, it's something you have to be passionate about. You really have to be passionate about the cause that you're going to fund because donors feel it, beneficiaries feel it. I think that's one of the, the most important pieces. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Delighted to be with you all. Thank you so much. Thanks. You've been listening to Philanthropy Unfiltered, a podcast series featuring interviews with philanthropists and leaders in the social sector. This podcast is a collaboration between the Ubuntu Education Fund and the Center for High Impact Philanthropy at the University of Pennsylvania. For more on this series, visit impact.upenn.edu. Thanks for listening.